Mega Man, aka Rockman, is known for its classic mainline series that is accompanied with multiple subline and spin off series. Of course, there were many artists involved that were irresponsible for the character, enemy, and environmental design, all with their own variations on the style. Nonetheless, like Street Fighter, Capcom did want to adhere to a certain guideline and game standard to keep the overall cohesion in the visuals and aesthetics. And thus, it might come to no surprise that the general color schematics and enemy designs have quite a lot of commonalities. Without a doubt, the first game set the tone for all to come and was released in 87 with the title Rockman on the NES game cover in the Japanese version. Multiple names floated around during the design phase, such as Mighty Kid, Noggle Kid and Rainbow Battle Kid. Names aside, the new company's character artist, Keiji Inafune, was put on the task to support the project. Truth to be told, he had no idea how to even start as a game character designer. Luckily his mentor, Akira Kitamura, came up with the concept designs of Rockman, his sister role and the creator Dr. Light in DOT graphics. And thus, Keiji was set out to add on and draw them into full illustrations. Actually, many of the robot masters were designed before he was put on the project, but he still created Elecman, Bombman, and many of the enemies. He said he was baffled that his designs were accepted and used in the game, especially due to the project director being quite strict. One of his suggestions was to make the Mega Man suit white, but it was soon apparent that the color blue made the animations more clear. Nonetheless, due to the limitations from the NES, the team got quite creative and KG said that he learned a ton from the director to fit everything in. To add on, the team had a vivid imaginative world that they wanted to express to the player, but KG commented that only the ending is the part that resonated well with the NES graphics. Although Capcom never had any official plans to make Mega Man 2, due to the many projects that were going on at the time, the team decided to just go for it. They gave themselves a 3 month deadline, and while Keiji was working on another project, he chipped in with all the time he could spare. This time around, he tried to make the art style a bit more anime-ish. Also, he reworked Dr. Willy, just to express a typical mad scientist. The robot masters were actually redesigns of children's drawings that were collected from a Mega Man art contest, which in my opinion was a brilliant move that must have saved the team a ton of time as they already were getting regular cycles of spending the night in their office to simply adhere to the strict deadlines. After the second game finished, a new director was assigned for Mega Man 3, which made the development process less streamlined. In this title, his brother Proto Man entered the scene. He was inspired by rival archetype Anim characters, containing a scarf and a shield to make him cool and tough. And like most NES games, the manual included art and illustrated abilities and mechanics to the player. In this case they added man's best friend, Rush, and the sliding mechanic. And this may sound old fashioned, back in the day these manuals were a real treat to inspect. In Mega Man 4 they added a new charge attack, an item box named Eddie, which was an unused concept for Mega Man 2, and they announced a new villain. Kozak, a young scientist genius that rivals his elderly peers. Furthermore, the Russian-inspired Kalinka entered the scene as well. Keiji said that the initial idea was to add more female characters between these dozens of men's in the game, and explicitly noted that she wouldn't be competing with Roll. In this game, Kaji was the new guy and entered as a character and enemy designer. In this installment, the artist complimented that the new Robot Master contest did a great job, with minimal tweaks on the winning kiddo designs. For example, Skullman, which I personally liked the most, was such a good design that the whole team discarded the previous level to create a new one just for him. In 92, Mega Man 5 was released and, like before, they changed the director once again, which forced character artist Keiji to explain again the core concept of the Mega Man franchise. Hench, he admitted that this was a difficult task. Nevertheless, because he was quite experienced by now, he set up a small team called the Rock Family to do the development work. Truth to be told, due to the hurdles it was tough to find new mechanics, but they did manage to introduce the power-up version of the charge shot. 
In 6, Cage admitted that the classical style changed slightly to be more similar to his SNES project, Mega Man X. Indeed, this meant that he did some overkill on the designs regarding the NNES capabilities. This time around, the robot monsters were from a contest held in the Western Hemisphere, which brought way different designs than Keiji was used to. He clearly noted that he loved the different type of creativity these kiddos came up with. Despite, as this was a new title, he himself had to activate his creative brain as well, and thus introduced the power and jet suit which both function as an armor made out of the dog parts. When we switch to Mega Man X, which also hit the shells in 93 on the SNES, the art team noted that designing X was way harder than they initially expected, purely because they were not used to the large range of colors, giving more room for detailed sprites. Actually, the concept of the power-ups and the X armor were from the RPG craze at that time, giving the player a sense of progression. While the legs, plate armor, and the buster weapon were quite obvious. The helmet's utility to break bricks originated as a joke. In case of Zero, KG wanted to make him the new Mega Man, more hardcore and anti-hero like. But he knew he couldn't pull it off to the higher ups. So he represented it as a sub-character, which, to his surprise, immediately got accepted. Enemies and bosses like Sigma and Vile were Yoshikawa's designs. He was mainly involved in the Breath of Fire series, and although he was new in the company, everyone admitted that they should keep an eye out on talent like that. The Maverick bosses were carefully designed to be cohesive with each other, yet distinct, keeping the animal silhouettes, color schematics like red, yellow and dark blue, into account. Of course, because the system had more capabilities, the team's excitement made them go all out with their designs trying out as many as they could, with new mechanics and visual appeal. A year later, X2 hit the shelves. Here, Keiji, who now had been the main character designer and illustrator, became more of a producer, looking at the big picture of the project. Nonetheless, new blood like Suda and Suga were in charge of the X designs. Many of the initial concept art were established before they joined, and thus, only had to make a fresh look on the illustration sides of things. Fun fact, this guy Surge looks like Dr. Willy, Roboto form. Nonetheless, the art team leaves his true identity to the player's imagination. Furthermore, the reason why they just brought Zero back to life was backed up by their genius statement, just because we can, plain and simple. For the bosses, they wanted more unique designs. And that's why they cancelled player contest submissions. They want to focus more on teens, who are a bit more of a hardcore player base. And thus, they deserve designs that were created by professionals. And they succeeded, because Mega Man X3 was released a year later, in December of 95. Now that Keiji was the official producer, he did work on some of the initial designs. Nonetheless, he admitted that he was possessive over Zero, because that was his character, and nobody was allowed to touch him. Some of the designs were based on their considerations to be translated to other projects as well, mainly action toys. In addition, because the art staff was busy with a lot of projects, they were sharing and transferring their boss designs to each other to such a degree that some of them don't even remember which one they worked on. A process that was quite common to keep the game adherent to one's style, basically forcing artists to uniform their work. Anyways, in case of the Seahorse, designed by Yoshikawa, the initial proportion was quite short and cute, but as it was a robot master, it was constantly sent back to make it taller and more intimidating than Mega Man. For Stigma, the only order he got was to make him messy, and so he did. The amount of minor enemies also shows how much work there had to be done. Thus with pain in their hearts, the design team outsourced the final illustrations for another art department. Like the others before, Mega Man 7 had only 3 months of development time, but still, the team persisted on perfectioning the minor details. As this game was on the SNES, they had a larger range of design choices to make. Although more challenging, they added more abilities to Rush, and introduced Bass and Treble, an anti-hero duo of the series. Due to the tight deadlines, there were a lot of artists working on this game. Tatsuya Yoshikawa, who was way more involved in Breath of Fire by now, also chipped in and did some small details. The producer Keiji even asked a temporary co-worker that was outsourced from Disney to opt in to help his team on the Robot Masters. With new hardware came great responsibilities. Mega Man 8 
was launched on the PlayStation in 96 and started off with a contest, gaining over 110,000 submissions for the Robot Masters. Such a massive amount brought smiles to the art team. And while many designs were focusing on dark Mega Man clones and evil bosses with terrifying weapons, the poison element was one of the most popular themes. And for a reason unknown, they didn't add it in. That aside, relatively new artists like Komaki and Hideki were given bigger responsibilities to do the enemies and boss designs. In this case Keiji was the full producer who almost didn't touch any of the artwork, but did some finishing touches on Proto Man. Mega Man X4 launched a year later on the PlayStation as well. And while the main illustrations of Mega Man games contained a lot of characters with a typical high saturated style and bold lines, this time around the artist Susugi tried to only involve the plot driving characters. And although the producer Keiji finally could give the game design out of hand to Tasaki and focus on the story himself, he made it clear that nobody was allowed to mess around with this original character Zero. Regarding the Maverick bosses, the artist mentioned that they wanted them to be more explicit in their poses and personalities. Because it took quite some design effort to make it work, they lowered the color saturation and asked illustrators to help them to keep the angles believable. In the end, the illustrators tried to maintain the poses to be as intended and added quite the amount of shadows. So much actually, it was more than the character designers preferred. And just to add on, that is mainly because when drawing a character in a sharp angle, the proportions quickly get stretched, especially if the eye is not guided correctly by the highlights and shadows. On another note, in case of the overall art style, the legs are gigantic and the forearms oversized compared to the rest of the body proportions. X5 was released in 2000, and the art clearly went to a lower saturation, making the whole aesthetic more cinematic. And just like the last entry, Sutsugi noted that the main illustration was focused on the story and tried to capture the setting as a whole. In case of the producer Keiji, he didn't really work on this title. He only instructed his team to finish the story. As for the Maverick bosses, they were inspired on an animal theme as many before them. Interestingly, the team got quite good at adding designs and showing off poses by now. And just as a miscellaneous side note, the American release changed the names of the Maverick bosses into Guns N' Roses references. Just like the latter game, X got multiple armors with their own set of utilities to switch between. The Reploids were intended to be his followers, and their designer stated that he knew he did a good job when everyone called them cheap Mega Man knockoffs. All in all, the fans wanted more, and a year later, X6 arrived. KG gave the green light to revive this project, throwing aside his personal opinion and admitting that he made a mistake by trying to end the series. Artist Tsutsugi said that the main illustration was focused on X, his newest and best asset, the Zero Saber. For the Maverick bosses, the team focused more on the little details, such as giving Commander Jemmerich a pilot helmet, and the boss Metal Shark legs that illustrates open shark jaws. Another neat little detail is that the blade armor, when shooting the boss weapon, has more of a bow appearance, but when the lightsaber emerges, it's a typical sword hilt. Last but not least, due to the dramatic ending of the last game, they on purpose designed Sigma to look like a mess. X7 was released in 03 on the PlayStation 2. This time around, KG stepped in as a designer to introduce a new character named Axel. To make sure his silhouette was distinctive enough from X and Zero, he decided to give him a handgun and useful facial features. Furthermore, because his background is dark, Axel was given a black armor. All in all, he stated that he wanted to actually make this game similar to the traditional action platforming gameplay and saw the 3D aspect as a mere graphic style choice. But nonetheless, the higher ups wanted it to be a full 3D game, which quickly became the standard back then. Also, Yoshikawa reappeared to work on the designs. Actually, he commented that because he had to take into account the 3D polygons, the final character designs didn't turn out as well as he expected. He stated that all the profile designs were done by different artists, and he did his best job to re-illustrate the final designs into one style. Mega Man X8 hit the stores in 05, and this time around, Yoshikawa was the main artist. He tried to avoid his own personal style into the final game art, to keep the silhouettes familiar with the series. However, he did make the joints thinner 
and the character proportions more realistic. He did so by visualizing the movements similar to action figures, with the sole thought that these models would be easier transitioned into 3D polygons. To add on, he was responsible for designing all 8 Maverick bosses without constraints, meaning he was allowed to deviate from the traditional guidelines. Nonetheless, he was a big fan of the original Mega Man X, and thus kept those bosses as a center design of his works. For the main characters, he tried to portray the robust X, Speedy Zero, and the confident Axel their personalities up front. Although the X series had ended, the classic Mega Man returned, with its old school graphics in the ninth entry during 2008. In this installment, Higurashi was appointed as the main character designer, as he had worked on quite the Mega Man titles in the past, and he admitted that he was glad that the producer Keiji approved his illustrations, knowing his artwork had made the cut to be the real thing. He admitted that this was a challenge to make the Robot Monsters, but they all had their classic Mega Man feel. His concern, however, was due to the use of repetitive shapes that could make the final design stagnate and boring. Furthermore, Higurashi noted that the special weapon color schemes were limited again and felt like they had already been done before, giving him a lot of stress. Because of the huge retro-style success, Mega Man 10 timed its debut in 010. Now the scepter of the main character artist was given to Mizuno, who indicated that he was a long-time Mega Man fan and copied the works of all that came before during his elementary school days. But now, he was allowed to make his own interpretations, and he loved it. And you can see this in his unique and quirky robot master designs, such as Sheep Man, with his bent over posture, and Strike Man, being a baseball with a catcher glove, not knowing if he is the pitcher or being pitched. Additionally, in this entry the special weapons, colors and poses were tough to reinvent compared to all that came before. While the Mega Man franchise did see a lot of spin-offs through the years, the classic game series re-entered the scene to celebrate its 30 year anniversary with the 11th installment in 2018. Like always, the main illustration shows all the robot monsters Mega Man has to face. Moreover, the designs were as top-notch as one could expect. Nonetheless, this time they didn't adhere to the 8-bit graphics and decided to go for 2.5D instead. This choice pushed the artist to add a bit more detail to the characters. That aside, they were all kept to adhere to the classic designs which was expected from this beloved mainline series. Indeed, with the 35th anniversary on its way, the 12th entry is in development to celebrate the franchise. The classic series still keeps strong, especially considering that the IP had such a solid impact on the older and younger generation of fans with its timeless crossovers and merchandise campaigns. Of course, there are many other spin-off series in the franchise which allows Mega Man to expand into other genres as well. In addition, the massive amount of artists that were involved to create countless of illustrations of this blue bomber were collected in art books and the like. One could consider that these act as a guide to a successful IP, so to say. All that said, just for fun, we're going to respect the elders and look at their ingenious cover art of their western releases. And indeed, they look like Mega Man from another dimension. Nonetheless, Capcom took them quite serious, as they made effort to create similar pieces for Mega Man 9 and even 10. I'm Fancy Light Novel author GP Fuchs, and in all honesty when I think about the NES era, Mega Man is one of the first games that pops into my mind, even considering I never owned a copy myself. And regardless of which title you started with, I think we all can agree that the series music is a blast to listen to.